Yeah, let's talk about testing. And uh, I'm Igor, I'm from Vilnius. I'm still not so get used to say that I'm from Vilnius because like, I'm, I have some Belarusian roots. And, but last three years I'm already in Vilnius and uh, I do data engineering at a company named Automatic. And I hope Clicker will work. It, it, that, oh, well, it works, yeah. So for last eight years I do, I do data engineering, but I do testing for quite a while. And uh, I'm still invited as a speaker for the, the testing threads or testing conferences. Uh, and uh, yeah, I still do testing anyway. And that was uh, one of the, my first, even though I joined Automatic as a data engineer, my first things were about testing because the moment, in a month after I joined, my boss told me, hey, we have problems with quality. <laughs> What, what, who can do that? So, okay, I, I want to, I know what to do, what has to be done there. And the reason I want, I know what has to be done there because in my previous company, I also worked in the area of testing in the data department. Uh, yeah, I do Scala, Python, and uh, some things like that. Oops, ah, I should press this button. What my company is doing, we're a company named Automatic because our CEO is Matt. And that's why we are automatic. And uh, the company, the most well known by uh, the product named WordPress, where the company behind WordPress, yeah, we dedicate some significant amount of our time to contribute to this product and grow it. But in addition to that, we are kind of maybe used, used to use Gravatar. I don't know who has a Gravatar account. Oh no, okay, it's so old school already. So yeah, but maybe someone also heard about Tumblr, so it somehow appeared to be our company as well. Uh, and uh, what's also interesting in, in, um, in uh, my company that we are fully distributed, uh, and it was, and we are already for how many years? Fifteen, I don't know. And uh, it's fully distributed company from the very beginning, and it's quite interesting experience and. Uh, kind of different culture in terms of the working style. If you wanted to discuss that, I'm also here, at least for a couple more hours. <laughs> uh, coming to the topic. So looks like uh, this topic is really narrow, how to test big data. But at the same time, um, I, heard, I got a feedback that there is almost no information actually what to do. So if you somehow appear to be a test engineer in data analytics department, this information will be extremely useful for you. If you are doing something else in testing, it will be maybe anyway interesting to know about how testing is done in uh, different areas. Uh, I, we will discuss what we test, then how we test, obviously, yeah, and uh, some fun things which comes from the big data. This is what we test normally. There are right now maybe a bit more fancy abbreviations like it, this is ETL, but right now it's more in what ELT, which is quite something from the same area, but a bit different ideas. But the whole idea of these applications is that you have multiple data sources and you, you want to get the data from all of them to the single storage and then uh, use this for some analytical insights to build dashboards, to see how businesses grow. And normally you don't have lots of clients in analytical applications, but no, they are really important. It looks like C-level, any top managers of your company are the main consumers of the information that you do produce to them. So what can be data source? Normally, the first data source that comes to your mind, it's some relation, relation, relational databases where your application data is stored. So if you have microservice architecture, you have multiple databases, but then you want to do some data analysis and you need to join data from billing to the data from, I don't know, signups, you can't really merge it and do some insights. So you pull all the data from the relative database to the single place and uh, this is your data source. So it can be, I don't know, some uh, third party vendors uploading some data to Amazon S3 and uh, this is where you are getting some information. It can be 
Google Analytics, it can be data from Facebook campaigns, it can be whatever. Uh, right now we are actively consuming GitHub data to in order to measure productivity. Uh, so this is, and right now I automated some parts of my reports, we, the weekly reports, so I just, okay, we have GitHub data, okay, how many commits my team members did merge this week, and things like that. Or my lovely part, just CSV files. So <laughs> they can come from any place. And uh, then you need to do the actual software com computations there. So out of all that dirty, really low level, it may be just log files with just Nginx logs, for example, like kind of, it can be whatever. So you get all of that. And then you can convert it, aggregate, deduplicate, filter, clean up, format, merge, join, and things like that. And yeah, do the data validations. So whatever comes to your mind. And then you put it to some warehouse where uh, the data is kind of accessible. It can be a data lake. It's also a modern term. So these three things like Amazon Redshift, uh, Microsoft Azure, BigQuery, these are the engines where you can go and write SQL on big data and um, get some insights. Or like in our company, this, play, uh, this nice thing plays the role of uh, data storage data. Who knows that, what this picture means? Maybe some, no, oh, it's HDFS Hadoop. So we are a more open source company, so we don't have so much in cloud, so we have our own infrastructure and on open source solutions we are maintain, keeping and maintaining big data. So we have Hadoop HDFS, this is where our data is stored. And how to test that? So this is like the object that is under our supervision and we want to somehow address the quality of this project and see if it works well or not. Let's see. First, yeah, let's write unit tests. So definitely it's software. So all these components that I described, definitely they are written in some code programming language. And uh, yeah, this is just example of the function that converts snake case to camel case, but this is just copy paste from our code base. It lives there for whatever reason, and we need to test it. And yeah, let's write unit tests that will actually do these conversions. Oh, by the way, do I have a thing like that? No, it doesn't work. Nope. Right. Okay. Uh, so, write unit tests. Then um, you can introduce other fast checks. Unit tests are by definition fast. And let's think about what, are, what other fast checks can be introduced. Code formatting. So if you are... It's definitely better to have the same code style in order not to argue I don't like this extra space here or things like that. So yeah, let's co come up with common format. It appears to be that uh, quote style for SQL is not a trivial story. We spend uh, quite a lot of time to discover uh, some, something that suits well. And uh, for now we're using just IntelliJ as a standard thing. St IntelliJ SQL formatter as a standard. So, but for Scala and for Python there are more, so, so this land is more standard, standardized. So yeah, but in SQL it's definitely, okay, should we capitalize select or just should we not capitalize it? It's so, things like that. Uh, check for, if you have some list of items, check for sorting, because you, normally if you have list of things, list of entities, it's definitely better to keep them sorted. So it's easy to check because you have a file with a list of things, go check that it is sorted and uh, make CI red if it's not sorted. And yes, yeah, there are no duplicated in things. Uh, also something where you can check some rules without launching the actual code. Yeah, and uh, uh, co programming languages usually come up with linters which do static analysis of your code and uh, this is where they can hint on potential problems. But I haven't seen any linters for SQL. And then we want to test the actual transformation. If you think about what transformation is, so you have some tables and we have some engine that converts uh, it to most likely to one table. 
In some cases, this transformation can be can produce multiple outputs, but it's not the best practice. Uh, it's easier to reason about them like, okay, many in, one out. And uh, we want to test such a thing. Mm, it can be whatever technology-wise. It can be BigQuery SQL, it can be Spark code, it can be Pandas uh, computation in Python, whatever. So, but the schema is the same, regardless of what engine you do for computations. And uh, this is how we write uh, transformation tests, <laughs> how to read it. So it's quite obvious. Uh, we want to calculate statistics about how many developers is in each country. And uh, we have an input data frame with a list of developers, and the country ID, and then the list of countries, and then we should say, okay, three people from Belarus and one, well, two from Lithuania. So just, and we need to join this of two and then do count by, uh, group, count and group by. But this is the output. Question for the audience, what? Vegetable should appear here. No, no. Any other ideas? What vegetable should be here? Come on. I am pressing like I should start counting down, like really. Well, come on, it's five here. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that yeah, yeah. You, people, you are dead, really. Like of course, it's cucumber. It's uh, the cucumber. Which, okay, the, the usually the framework for that is a cucumber, and the language is, itself is a gherkin, so kind of which is also cucumber, but small one, and um, yeah, which is good for vodka, I think. I don't know. So yeah, the framework here. But why? It seems like why gherkin and cucumber we use for transformation tests, because if you think about uh, this problem. Okay, the problem seems simple, okay, like we just need to provide some tables and validate the output against another table. What's wrong here? The problem here that how to make it into one file. Because what, you, what, what options do we have? We can have CSV file, but then it means that we have three, file, three CSV files as an input and one CSV file as an output. If you want to read it, you need to open three tabs with three files and somehow understand what's going on. Uh, in one case, we had an Excel spreadsheet, and in Excel, there was a concept. Well, you can obviously put it into multiple sp uh, spreadsheet tabs, but in spreadsheets, there is a concept named named range, something like that. So you can actually distribute this data somehow that. If you want to put table data in the code, in Python, Scala, and whatever, it's even worse, because you can store their plain text. So because like all this table information is kind of plain text. And uh, it appears that the Gherkin is almost the only language where tables are supported natively. So table support is the main feature that is really needed. And um, somehow it's really convenient. You can implement the steps uh, and, uh, in, in, in many languages. Also, it plays like a documentation, which is uh, initial idea of Gherkin, actually, to make this, uh, to play this role. Easy to start. Uh, when some people try to make new transformation these days, I told them, okay, you need to write SQL and test in Gherkin. And they're like, okay, Gherkin, what? I need to learn another programming language to write the test for you. But, okay, SQL, I know, but the Gherkin, really? But then, okay, don't worry, so it's really simple. And so people used to, used to it, really. Kinda, it's easy for adoption. Uh, and at the same time, there is, uh, there is a common story with Gherkin is the fact that if you want to test your business logic in Cucumber, uh, there is a problem with the dictionary because the number of steps that you need to describe. So you're, you're describing business logic. It's more like, okay, the user can put something to the shopping cart, uh, the user do check out, the user go here, the user go there, and the vocabulary, the number of these steps that you can use in your test is growing. But with uh, ETL, kind of, I don't remember when we wrote uh, last time the new step for Gherkin, because kind of the number of things that is needed is quite limited. So dictionary is really limited. Everyone right now nearby knows what is the list of available keywords to write a test. So yeah. But it's not BDD, we don't do BDD, so it's just a convenient way to describe data tests, the transformation tests. 
Uh, if people are really lazy and they don't write the test for their transformation, so we still test them, but we test them this way that we generate random data and uh, we throw away output, uh, but at least we know that once it will be deployed to production without tests, it will not crash. So this is kind of, but good enough because kind of we know the schema, the input schemas, and we generate something and uh, it helps to catch bugs as well. Then uh, we go to step up. All that small transformations that kind of here are connected because if you think one output from one transformation can be used as an input for another transformation, right? And this all come then merge to this uh, name as DAG, which is directed acyclic graph. So directed, yeah, because there is a so first of all, it's a graph. There are nodes and uh, edges. Uh, it's directed because the, the edges are directed, because there is a direction. And acyclic, it's an important feature here, because if you somehow come up with the cycle distributions, it's not clear how to actually do the computations. Because, OK, we computed this table, and then you have a loop. And uh, then it's not clear. OK, here it's clear. We first need to compute table 0, then table, table 2, and then table 1, right? Uh, but if you have a cycle, do I have a wrong picture? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Yeah, you will find a bug here. OK, good Good for testing the uh, presentation. So yeah, there should be cycle here. <laughs> so, and this is where uh, this how we how detect that, uh, that problems. Uh, consistency, so you whatever dependencies in a graph you define, they goes to somewhere and they kind of make sense. Uh, version compatibility in terms that uh, it's all in Python and there may be some libraries which are incompatible. So what we do here, we don't really launch it for computation, we, but we launch it to the, okay, can you at least build that? And if some kind of some libraries can't be can't be installed, then it's failing. And yeah, other infrastructure issues that can happen, uh, but at the same time, yeah, it's really hard to run it fully because normally this thingy runs for the day. So this is where we are quite coming to the topic of test environment, because if we want to test something before actually deploying to production. Normally, this big data infrastructure is already quite expensive. Also, there is PI, uh, private data there as well. So, and there are a couple of approaches how to make a test cluster with some reasonable data. So, you can um, normally what you do, you have okay, hundreds of servers here, but test environment will be three servers. So, you should at least replicate the topology of the things happening. You shouldn't have one server because the data should be replicated and things like that. The, sorry, things like that should be counted. One approach is just chunk. Uh, chunk your tables into, uh, just get some subset of your data. But if you think about how to get subset of your data which makes sense, it's not as easy as it seems to be. You can't select just top 10 records, because if you select top 10 records here and top 10 records here, uh, there should be consistency between them, because you have a list of users and list of actions. So, and actions should belong to some users, and vice versa, user should have action. So, it's really complicated to keep subset of data in, in, in one place. What we managed to do, so we were quite lucky not to have lots of PII, uh, personal information. Uh, at the same time, the, the big table was the only one that we had. And this data was quite stream of events. So we just uh, concatenate, uh, cut only a small subset of this one big table and keep all the production data in the test cluster. So yeah, you should also think about data obfuscation as well. So if, if like yeah, I told about private, about whatever secrets might be stored in the production database. Or another approach, you can just try to write some scripts to populate your test environment with some fake data, which seems like production-like. So, but it also requires quite a lot of time. 
another approach that we are actually using, we have a test cluster, but it's more like to test the infrastructure for the DevOps part of things. But in order to test what we do, so imagine you have a job that writes to production, so this, this one. Uh, and you made some modifications here, and you want to test it manually. Uh, so you also launch the same job, but you're from the code from your branch, but write output to the same on the same cluster, but on a separate storage. So it means that kind of the input here and there is the same, but the code is different. But it's all run on the same uh, cluster. It means that you're actually testing only this part. And then you can, for example, compare that the tested version makes sense versus the production one. OK, I added new column. I see it. it, it it's kind of reasonable. Uh, and here we come to another issue, which is Oracle issue. But it's not the, who knows about Oracle issue in general. Yeah, but it's not about this Oracle. So it's about this Oracle. Uh, so this Oracle, so if you think what this Oracle does and how it's related to testing, it's just, it's not about data, it's just in general what Oracle issue, where to get expected result because you did some computations. And for example, the revenue of the company grown by 30% last two weeks. Okay, is there a bug there or not? Maybe there is a bug in computations and really it was 35 or 25. How to actually, okay, you can write unit tests, you can compare maybe new code versus old one, but the Oracle issue is really important, uh, is, is a big problem uh, when you do a manual testing of this because kind of it makes sense for me. But then you go to the, some uh, stakeholder and say, hey, I built a new report for me. And think, What's bullshit? Like your data is wrong because kind of. And this is where I don't have a good answer. And, and this is what role Oracle actually in ancient Greece played. Uh, so you come to Oracle and ask, OK, what gods are saying to us to do? So should we harvest our, uh, like, I don't know, should we seed our crops? So like, well, do harvest and uh, OK, how, whatever you want to ask for from gods, you go to Oracle. And uh, yeah, we don't have Oracle here. So most likely, What's one good advice here is to find the business owner and try to validate results with the business owner who, who knows the area. And uh, then it happens like that. Hey, I did some computations. Do you think the data makes sense? And then you might get a feedback. Okay, it makes sense. Or okay, this data looks suspicious. Let's investigate and check together. So because like the reason the data is not much in our expectations might be quite different because maybe the computations are wrong. This is where it, what testing is doing, but maybe it's actually different. And uh, the, you are making an impact on business uh, saying that, okay, maybe the data, we are not doing as bad as we thought or as good as we thought, whatever. And all that thing that I right now discussed about the approaches about testing, it's pretty much fits well to this well-known pyramid of tests. So you should have lots of unit tests, so you have small amount of API tests, UI tests should be here, but not so much. And there is some unclear cloud of manual testing that should be still present. And uh, how it matches. So yeah, we talked about unit tests, but I, I can't say that we have a big foundation of unit tests here, uh, because the majority of tests that we write, it's transformation tests, all these Gherkin tests. Uh, right now I see our GitHub repo and looks like we don't write uh, SQL or Scala, we write Gherkin, because this is the top popular language in our repo. <laughs> so because of, yeah, we, we need to test things. Uh, these UI things are usually more expensive, and this integration deck test, when you kind of launch in the whole thing together, they are more expensive and harder to reproduce. And then, yeah, you also do manual testing uh, the same way with this, yeah, kind of problem with Oracle. On top of that, let's apply the best available practices that uh, are present. So continuous integration, uh, con continuous deployment, delivery, this is what's in place. And this is what helps uh, my team and my uh, kind of product uh, to survive. So people kind of come in, they're making pull requests, they're writing tests, one merge request, pull request is merged and approved. 
it goes to production and no one do deployment. Uh, it just appears automatically on production. And yeah, it helps for us to do iteration, uh, fast iterations and things like that. We do invest a lot of uh, into um, in our testing infrastructure because, for example, this I mentioned that previous stuff uh, story about we launch the test uh, for we, we, you write a branch and then you test your transformation. But if you think about what you want to test, it's really not so easy because normally if you change one uh, node on this computational deck. It somehow affects all the downstream as well. And uh, I updated, I tested my transformation, but I don't know what the impact is there. So I want to run manually the down, down, downstream one, downstream the transformation. So kind of we write a tool in that allows user, okay, launch everything, what is downstream as well, and show me what's happening with my code changes. Yeah, it's important because it's about our productivity, it's about quality, and yeah, it's about continuous whatever. And uh, yeah, bunch of things about more data specific because all of the things before it's just how normal testing practices are adapted to data world. Data monitoring. So once data is in production, you need to make sure. So there are tests that are actually executed on prod. So it's more like um, health checks, but. Uh, Let's start from the simple thing like foreign key. It seems easy to have a foreign key on a normal database, but if your data is distributed uh, on, in the multiple nodes, it's hard to say the database engine that, uh, okay, there is a foreign key. So because it's quite impossible. And uh, also it's not, even if you have a foreign key, it's most likely it will be not, there is a concept of eventual consistency. So you might update this table and this table, but there uh, you pull the production data in different times. So it's consistent on the old, old data, but the fr fresh chunk of data might not be consistent. So all of that things makes foreign key validation a bit harder. So, but we, you can just go and say it and validate that after the data is computed. Uniqueness should be also programmatically defined uh, non-null values. It's the most important, the most popular reason of our jobs failures is that we, you define the schema that this data shouldn't be nullable. And in some case, the data is nullable. And uh, yeah, here we go, we have a, you never know what's there. If it is a bug or feature, there is some, data, in new data coming in, there is a business logic change, but this is the most popular null value validation. A null validation which is close to, well, uniqueness means that, yeah, you have a column with, and all data should be unique, and enum, it's more like all data should be from this predefined list of, okay, you have list of statuses, active, disabled, suspended, and not, not other statuses should appear there. And some business rules, which are kind of, we know what our data looks like. And these business rules, if they are programmed, they helps us to keep the data under control. Let me give an example from our production. So kind of, if you have two columns started at and ended at, so you have either started at should be before ended at, or ended at should be now. So you kind of, if you want to define the test uh, of, in our ecosystem, so you go and write this line of code and you have another production validation which will fail and notify you if this condition is violated. Uh, this is more funny things, which I like more like with the person from math background, which is anomaly detection, it's ML. So the idea is that you build a model which will say with, for example, 95 or 99 percent of probability that the data, some values should be in specific range. So this is a typical thing, how the data looks like. Uh, why do we have these things? Huh? Why it's not lying? Okay. Yeah. 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 Why it's jumping? Well, I mean, the, when I see this picture and you work with data, normally you're like, oh, okay, I know what I'm looking at. It's weekly chart. So, because normally you have, either you have more 
No, normally, people do more on, on weekdays and on uh, weekends is kind of... And normally, they don't do anything at night. Well, it can be daily as well, but uh, counting but by the number of dots, it's daily daily chart, but weekly uh, seasonality. And, in, and your model that tries to predict this interval, which is red in here, should count for that seasonality. So you can't just build a line and predict everything by line, because you actually know that it's OK for people to do less on weekends. So you, you build some kind of these models with seasonalities, and there is yearly seasonality. Monthly seasonality, there are things like there are models that predict that say, Black Friday should be spike or after Christmas Day should be deep, depending on your business. So you build this model, which with 99% of probability says that the, the next dot should be in this interval. And what's happened there, we are interested here in these dots, which are, goes out of interval. And this is where you should alert, OK, something went wrong. Because we know that the data should be this way. Normally, people are not so conf so worried about when you have more users and more more money, but these do dots which goes be below, yeah, below, they seems to be a problem. But this is uh, how you write flaky test actually, because by definition it's ninety nine percent of probability, so it means that. Uh, Whatever model you built, you can maybe name 99.99. Uh, you can tune the model, but then it will be useless because, so in this case, it will go maybe below zero or whatever. Like, well, it's not zero, it's scaled chart, but anyway. So kind of the problem with these validations is they are flaky by default, by just by definition. And uh, we don't have much success here, even though it's fancy, uh, because, yeah, like you, you generated lots of them in some moment, and then uh, people got pinged and oh, okay, it seems normal. Okay, data backs to normal, and then people t tend to ignore that. And uh, right now, it's maybe we should just shut down the system and uh, rethink the whole idea uh, from the beginning. But yeah, it's a fancy way to detect the uh, anomalies of your data. Uh, ownership management is also like more specific to my company uh, because we have so many people over all the things all over the world and all of them kind of using some subsets of data and uh, it's it's impossible for the single team to serve all of them so we switch to so named self service data analytics if someone needs some data they come and create a pull request and this is where ci cd and all testing rules should are important because people are coming without actual knowledge of what they're doing. Uh, and it took us a while to actually distribute the ownership, like, okay, you, this is your tables. If something goes wrong there, you will be notified. You're the, the main person to actually react to this set of alerts uh, and things like that. Or if people are ignoring something for a week, I personally go and say, hey, looks like you are ignoring this table problems for a while. Do you st do, are you really using this table? Maybe we should just delete it, uh, things like that. And yeah, a piece of AI. So I wanted to Google some picture about uh, this concept and wasn't able to do things. So I asked AI to generate me the picture how bugs, how production bugs are detected by data analytics solutions. And uh, I touched a bit this moment already a couple of times. If you have some problem with data, if your testing tools detected some anomaly, some data inconsistency, it might mean the bug in the transformation code. But the most likely, well, it may be also the logic upstream is changed. It's also possible. But also in lots of cases, it means that there are some production issues. If you have lost lots of, there are not so many people are signing in to your application. Maybe just sign in is broken. Or, but there are so many things you can think about how to detect production issues uh, and actually product bugs. So once you are investing into the testing of these solutions, analytical solutions, you're actually helping a lot to detect original production product issues. And this is where we are living. Oh yeah, that's another story. Big data means big money that you spend on the cloud. And uh, you should be really careful there, and you spend lots of time trying to optimize things. How, it's not actually 
I don't know. It, if, it's about quality, maybe. But if you think uh, it's not actual bugs, but uh, when you are uh, paying so much money for something, maybe you should optimize and do things more carefully. And uh, all these cloud providers, if you try to upload big data to them, uh, the business will come to you quite often asking for, can we do something to make it cheaper? So wrap it up before the end of the day on this audience. Standard things, principles are applicable, but you should just need to know the standard uh, approaches for testing and think, and think about how to apply whatever business application you have to them or them to business application. Well, this is an interesting story. So the lack of DevSys on UI, we don't discuss flaky test almost all the time because kind of you have input, you have output, and something which works synchronously. And uh, flaky test might appear in some cases, but they are relatively rare, and um, uh, it's easy to handle. Uh, some uh, data specific things are already here. It's, it's you should think how to scale your approaches, and yeah. It also helps to find production bugs, and it's a lot of fun to play with data, to play with numbers, and make some value out of them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Igor, for presentation. And are there any questions? Thank you. Okay, for me, like security guy, the most interesting thing in your presentation is anomaly detection. Mm -hmm. uh, could you give some short approach how you can, how, how I can build it in my company, for example, what you do to build uh, your approach to detect anomalies? The models are well known. So just kind of there is profit library from, from Facebook where you can just okay, feed your data, describe what seasonality you want to count, and it builds this line and then, okay. And then uh, the main question is the ownership and actually, because you have lots of data and what to do actually when something goes wrong. This is the most complicated part and this is where we don't have much success. But maybe if you build this only for the something which is really important, Maybe it will be paid more attention. Also, there is a problem if you even think about this story. You can make, have, even though, okay, you have total number of events, it's fine. But if you try to split it by country, you might have the problem in some country. It means that the number of this validation should be quite, you just multiply the number of validations by number of countries. So it's not so easy as it seems like, but it's more like, there is not, nothing more. There are more questions, so to say, than uh, engineering one uh, here. Yeah. My question will be kind of again also about the anomaly detection, right? Okay, it's the most that's, popular. Yeah, yeah most that's, that's, that's something that we have a lot of stuff going on with, right? Um, so, my question is about how do you still like? Can you elaborate? How do you still work with that? Because obviously this anomaly detection will lead you to these flaky tests, yeah. right? Because you cannot build a stable test that will be like checking the quality of your data because of these anomalies and because these anomalies can be actually normal, right? Sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, because and, the business changed. Yeah, yeah. Well, not only business changed, because, because of many things, right? Yeah, yeah. But still, what are your approaches? How do you how do you still test this data? Do you use any kind of algorithms to deal with that? What is your approach on writing these tests and making them less flaky? Well, I found one example where actually anomaly detection helped us. Actually, it, find, it finds right now lots of problems, uh, but uh, it's not as fancy as you think. Like There is right now anomaly detection everywhere, uh, which checks that for absence of the data. So if the data, if, if you have zero in some place, so this is definitely should be investigated. And uh, well, unless if you have, okay, if you have five, 10, one and zero, not really. But if you have 10K, 15K, 20K, 1K and zero, most likely it's a product issue, there is some integration issue, or this data is not valid anymore because we, the production was changed and uh, we don't, 
produce this data anymore, then we need to delete this table or disable the transformation and keep only historical data. So this is the story of success where, so we started with these simple rules. Uh, again, algorithm is really simple. So kind of you, you right now, it's, if you ask the student from uh, st statistics to build such a model, they will build it. Uh, help, Slack helps. So right now, when something goes wrong with some table, this is where we ping people in Slack, and they're like, oh, OK, I'm being touched. need to do something. And if they're pinged in a, seven weeks in a row, then I come and say that, hey, let's do something here. So yeah, what to say about algorithms? That's kind of Python library standard one and uh, Slack and Weep. <laughs> Let me share my context to, to ask you my question generally. Uh, we store uh, data from different sources, like you said, GitHub, Jira, I don't know, Allure, to be able to uh, visualize uh, something for a testing purpose. So uh -huh. it is like internal analytics. Okay. Every time when we ask something to do, uh, the first uh, solution that analytics provides, uh, like share wrong numbers. Like after using this data, we can detect what is the issue, what was the reason for that, so why it is happening, because it is not probably clear all business requirements from the beginning, and we could maybe not uh, uh, consider some of the use cases and it will affect those numbers. The question is about uh, like an analytic for external events. When we get uh, those this data from how our product uh, use our customers, so it is a huge data, and nobody knows uh, with, like, which we can compare those results. Because, for you example, exactly this, you exactly described Oracle issue. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so even and though, <laughs> yeah, if, if you have Jira, for example, we can build some simple dashboard there yeah. and check some the, some of those cases. But yeah. here. Again, nobody knows what is the uh, like correct one. What is the correct information? And it is a huge issue, and uh, there are a lot of different uh, like reasons for that. And uh, do you have any actually practices? You shared some of them, mm -hmm. but generally, again, how to trust this data? How to check that data is accurate, really, or not? And again, seasons yeah. okay, but what else? Yeah, uh, cross check helps. So if you have some, if you have some way to cross check the data from different sources, so normally, uh, like I, kind of I don't know, you have some billing data and you have some logs from the server and they should match. If you have event from payment and you have event from backend uh, that user paid, so this da data should match eventually. So if you cross check, you might find issues in both things. This helps if you don't have anyone to ask. So, but you should understand that this, this event should be independent. Uh, so this helps, for example. Uh, what levels of tests do you use for that? Mm -hmm. How to check this like, uh, kind of things? Well, this kind of, this is what I said, like a business rules uh, checks where you can, it's kind of, if you have SQL, uh, oops, I'm clicking on the wrong way. So if you can run SQL over your engine and you have two tables, it's quite easy. Just write SQL and see that output to, we have some, some concept of test, uh, test transformation, which is part of the DAG, which is the kind of once all upstream tables are updated, so certain, most likely, it's SQL is being executed, and we say that, okay, this SQL should return zero records. And if it's more than zero, there is an alert. Or then it appears, oh, okay, here we, we have some ancient few records from our source tables, which are okay. Then we say, okay, this scale should return only 10 records. So, but if we have a line on the records, usually it's a new record, and then we come back to the data source and say, hey, kind of, oh, yeah, 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 I, I went right now manually, I modified it for my customer and things like that. So th this whole cycle happens quite a lot, almost daily. Uh, yeah, so... And uh, you write those tests in Gergli? No, 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 it's, uh, it's what I meant, data... Uh, come on, I'm clicking on the wrong way. Uh, so yeah, the, the, this test, data monitoring. Because you need the production data. These Gherkin tests, you are testing on synthetic data. So this is where I, I already know what my transformation should do. And this is where like I expect, it's based on my expectations, but then... It's more like, I don't, yeah, it's more like unit tests on synthetic, automated tests and you do on synthetic data. But then once you, you 
do, we have a checkbox in PR that any changes that you do, you need to test manually. It seems it means that you need to run the transformation against production data, and this is where, yeah, no, uh, you mean I, you define the business rules this way or another, and this is how what helps, yeah, or. Establish a good communication with your business. Like in my case, like we have a really tough CEO in one moment. It was if you come to, you should come really with clear data to him. Like kind of, if you show something which is don't match his expectation, it, he will be angry and half of the team can be fired. But if you have someone below him with whom you can say, hey man, like we build that doesn't make sense, and he's like, oh yes, and but. I'm, I'm, I'm think here something is wrong. Okay, we do some cycles here, and then after that we go to CO and saying, hey, we validated this report with this guy. <laughs> it should be proper data. But yeah, without deep business law knowledge and domain, um, normally you, you can't say whether, whether this 30% or 45%. Uh, you have no idea normally. Okay, thank you for interesting discussion. I can, I think we can uh, wrap up and. Yeah. Uh, Thanks Thank for you, coming. Igor.